الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن ولا وبعض فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أيها الأخوة الكرام وأخوات السيدات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the opportunity to discharge our responsibilities. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ad-deen al nasiha And the companions, they asked him, Liman? He said, Lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi wa li a'immatil muslimin wa a'ammatihim. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companions, radiallahu anhum, the deen is advice and conformance. And they asked him advice and conformance to whom? He said, advice and conformance to Allah and to his book and to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Advice and conformance to the leadership of the Muslims and the advice and conformance of the Muslims to one another in their general population. In the Salah, our Imam, he recited for us an advice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that began with a question. The question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked us, O you who believe, why is it that you say what you don't actually do? Hateful is it in the sight of Allah that you say what you don't do? And the surah continued. إن الله يحب الذين يقاتلون في سبيله سفا كأنهم بنيان مرصوص. And it's very important for us to understand why these ayats. إن الله يحب الذين يقاتلون في سبيله سفا كأنهم بنيان مرصوص. Why it comes after that question? What is the context? Because the Muslims. We are very particular about religious matters. We argue with each other about religious matters. We differ with each other about religious matters. We stand even in different places behind different people based on religious matters. Yet when the time for the Salah comes, we are not able to do that. When the Salah comes, it can only be behind one Imam. So no matter what different opinions we have, what different feelings, madhahibs, which we share, and what different arguments we have, and what different approaches we have. When the order comes, Aqimus Salah, no one has any choice. 
but to form the saf. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينِ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ مَرْسُوسٌ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينِ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ سَفًا سَفًا كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ مَرْسُوسٌ And if the Muslims were to take their positions outside of the masjid as they do inside of the masjid most of the problems which the Muslims have in the world today would be over but we are willing to come to the mosque those of us who come and line up and respond to the Imam when he says we don't have a problem to respond to that because this is a matter of ritual. It's a matter of ritual everywhere in the world. The Muslims, minimally, if they do nothing else, they are performing this ritual. They are lining up. And they are listening to the Imam. And when he says, Allahu Akbar, and he goes to Ruku, they say Allahu Akbar and they go to Ruku. When he says Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, they are following Rabbana Alakil Hamd. When he goes to Sajda, they go to Sajda. When he comes back, so forth and so on, until he makes Taslim. Immediately after the Imam makes Taslim, he loses the command of the people. Nothing. Now everyone has his own opinion again. Everyone has his own madhahib, his madhab again. Everyone has his own approach. Everyone goes back to their own home, eats their own food, and fulfills their Islamic responsibility as individuals. And so here is where the problems begin. And this is where the problems can be resolved. Now, as a new Muslim, I have to admit that there are many of you sitting here today whose classical knowledge of Islam far beyond what I can say. So there is no need for me to try to give you a great deal of classical information. Because what the Imam cannot give you, there are others who can give. And what they cannot give, they're in the books here in your library, or they're in the books in your homes. So what can a new Muslim offer when there is so much classical information available for us? But I can recall for myself struggling as a new Muslim to understand why the Muslims with all of their classical knowledge how it is that they form very strong minorities in the Western countries But they, outside of the masjid, outside of the masjid, their voice is only a whisper. Inside the mosque, the Muslims who live in Australia, the Muslims who live in America, the Muslims who live in the UK, inside the masjids, in and around the mosques, the Muslims, they have very loud voices. They have lots of opinions. They are very strong about their feelings. And they are doing many acts of worship. But outside of the mosque, their voices are hardly a whisper. And the evidence, the evidence 
of their religion, the evidence of the Quran, and the evidence of the Prophet ﷺ Sunnah is hardly more than a gesture. And so I, as a new Muslim, I always wanted to know why. Why it is that the common person outside of the mosque, who live around this mosque, and certainly more non-Muslims live around this mosque than there are Muslims. For every one Muslim who lives around this mosque, or who pass in front of this mosque, there's another 99 who is a non-Muslim. And I can tell you as a new Muslim that the 99 people who pass in front of this mosque for every one Muslim that comes here or prays here, out of those 99, very few of them have any idea what we do inside. Where they gain their information about what we do and who we are, they gain it from television. They gain it from the radio. They gain it from magazines. And they gain it from newspapers. Why? Because we Muslims who come in and out of the mosque, we only discuss Islam and we only do the rituals while we're in the mosque, but outside the mosque, in the workplace, where we're working with the non-Muslims in the colleges where our children go or where some of us have attended, we don't talk to them about Islam. And in our neighborhoods where we live predominantly with non-Muslims, we don't talk to our neighbors about Islam. Islam for us is personal. It's personal. It's our religion. It's our faith. It's our tradition, and we're just living among the non-Muslims because there is some benefit for us to do so. And I can say to the Muslims here that this issue itself, <clears throat> our attitude regarding the non-Muslims, it has contributed as much to our condition as their intrusion into our lands, their raping of our women, their killing of our children, their confiscating of our natural resources, and their stepping upon our faces and their disrespect of our religion, we have contributed as much towards it. Now, we could easily be reactionaries. We can be angry. We can shout, and we can march, and we can point, and we can blame, and we can say, George Bush, Tony Blair, John Howard, this one, Yahudi, blah, blah, so and so, we can say. But as I move around the Muslim world, alhamdulillah, as a new Muslim, I have been to probably every country that is represented here. Maybe there are 37 different nationalities here. So I have visited at least 37 countries where the Muslims are my majorities. Another 26 countries where Muslims are minorities. So I have seen the Muslims. And in most cases, the Muslims, we are blaming others. And we should be blaming them because they are in most cases, they are concerning Allah and His Messenger وسلم, and the issues of Qiyamah and the issues of Iman. They are worthy of blame. But what about us? Are we worthy of blame? And what can we do to reverse the condition which we are in?
In the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us the question, why is it you say what you don't do? It means here, not that we don't read the Quran, not that we don't read hadith, not that we don't perform the rituals that we have been ordered to do, not that we don't support kalama la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa not that we don't pray, yes we do pay zakah, or we at least admit we should pay zakah, yes we do fast in the month of Ramadan, yes we, we go and make hajj, but what do the Muslims do besides that? What do they do besides that? Most of us sitting here, our families, originally came from another place. There are not too many people in this room here who themselves are original Australians. You are second generation, third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation maybe, Australians. Your great-grandfather or grandfather or father came here under certain conditions, or your fathers came here under certain conditions, and you came here under certain conditions. And in most cases, the conditions had something to do with the destabilization of the country in which way you came from. The destabilization, the social, political, economic, destabilization of that country. And most of the time, the very people who we wind up living with them are the people who contributed to the destabilization of our countries. So think about the irony, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forces us, forces us out of our homes. We didn't choose to leave, forced us out. And we wind up in the very place of the people who contributed to forcing us out. And when we found ourselves on the way or before we got here, we had the desire to be someplace where we could speak our minds. Because when they destabilized our countries, they put in the place they put there for us unjust rulers. They educated them. They gave them the orientation. They gave them their seats. And they told them how to rule the Muslims. And they have been ruling us. And so our our leaders, forget their names, because it's not important. Our leaders have contributed to more tyranny, slaughter, oppression of Muslims than all the Kafirs together. Our leaders today, I cannot speak this way to my Muslim brothers in the 14 major countries where Muslims reside in the world today, I cannot speak this way. They would not allow me. But the non-Muslim, they allow me. MashaAllah. My country, America, the big oppressor. They allow me to travel around the world and to speak and to preach and to teach. Of course, there's a price. And I'm willing to pay that price, MashaAllah. And someone from Australia, he can do the same. And a Muslim from UK can do the same. And a Muslim from France, he can do the same. Why? Because at least Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have placed in these countries, in their co basic constitution, the ability for us to speak. Whereas in the Muslim countries, who are the holders of the Quran, Allegedly, the preservers of the sunnah, we have no right to speak. Even we have no right to even gather. Now, I'm saying all of this because I want you to understand 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his design he took us from one place in which we had the traditional name Muslim but we did not have the right to gather or to speak or to preach we didn't have it here we are in another place all of us where we have the right to do it but we don't we don't in America on an average of 78,000 people become Muslims every year this is after September the 11th just this past year 103,000 people become Muslims in America last year 87,000 the year after September the 11th 78,000 before September the 11th on an average of 46,000 so we would wonder how the number jumped like that when the Muslims are under the greatest amount of oppression when the name of Islam is being bashed and trashed shattered and battered and scattered every place confused Muslims Islam Quran Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being confused mixed up with terrorism fanaticism extremism yet as the Imam he recited in the prayer they intend to blow out the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extinguish the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by blowing with their mouths but Allah would not have it that his light be extinguished but that he would perfect it even though the unbelievers or the munafiks or the mushriks they would hate it this is his plan and I want to tell you brothers and sisters that the 78,000 people or the 87,000 people or last year the 103,000 people who have entered Islam in America most of them are entering Islam through other new Muslims seven out of ten people that accept Islam in the Western world where most of the new Muslims are coming the Western world seven out of ten that accept Islam in the Western world they are accepting it from new Muslims you would ask yourself how is that now I don't say you don't contribute you do <clears throat> mashallah my teacher in Quran is from the Punjab my teacher in fiqh is from Egypt my teacher in Aqidah is from Saudi Arabia my teacher in Risala of the Prophet Sallallahu is from another place so each of the teachers are from people like yourselves who have contributed what they supposed to contribute alhamdulillah but the actual preaching of Islam and the spreading of Islam by mouth person to person primarily it is coming from new Muslims I give you an example just in the past three months alhamdulillah in the past three months out of 237 shahadas 72 of those new shahadas themselves already give a shahada 72 of the people who become Muslims in the last three months which I know about 72 of them out of the 237 they already give another shahada And I wonder to myself, how is it that Muslims who are Muslim all their lives, born with the Quran in their mouth, understanding from the beginning who is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, standing behind an Imam in some place in the world all of their lives, how they arrive in the Western world, eating and drinking, benefiting at a level that no one else in the world is eating and drinking and benefiting, how? they don't talk to their neighbor they don't talk to their colleague in the university they don't talk to their co-worker about Islam 
And so we want to know why our condition is what it is. The Prophet وسلم, he said, a time will come when the nations of the world will invite one another to consume the Muslims as if they were just like a plate of food. They will invite each other to the Muslims like some hungry people will invite each other to a plate of food when it is thrown in their midst. And the companions were surprised of the Allah Anhum. Because the Prophet ﷺ is telling them this at what time? In the early stages? No. After Fatul Makkah. After Fatul Makkah. When the Muslims was very strong, very powerful. And so they asked him, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will we be in the minority, will we be a small number at that time when that happens to us? He told him, no. On the contrary, you will be in the majority, you will be a very great number. But your enemies, they will have no respect for you. That's one. What is our condition today in the Muslim world? We are 1.6 billion in the world today, the new statistic. So we are a great number. But what is our condition in the eyes of the non-Muslims? They have no respect for us. Sadaqa Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next thing he said, he said they will have no respect for you. And you will have no substance. Your substance will be like the bubbles on the ocean when it comes to the shore and goes back out. Froth, scum, bubbles, trash. He's speaking about our substance, not our numbers here. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will strike something in your heart which is called wahin. And those were Arabs he spoke speaking to. They should understand the language, but they did not. This was a new terminology. They didn't know. Because they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is this wahin? He said, Hubb dunya wa karahiyatul maut. Inordinate attachment, pursuit of dunya, occupation, preoccupation, pursuit, love, attachment to dunya, and an apprehension from whatever might lead to death. Karahiyatul maut is not just the idea of dying. Karahiyatul maut means that you hate the idea of death and anything that might lead to death, including inconvenience or injury. Even the Muslims today, they don't want to be inconvenienced. The Muslim today doesn't even want to be injured. So if you will not be inconvenienced, and if you were not to be injured in defense of this religion, or in the propagation of this religion, or in the establishment of this religion, then it means your condition is one where you have less devotion and commitment to the religion than your enemies. O Muslims, we want to know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, Udu'u ila sabili rabbik bil hikmah wal maw'idatun hasana wajadilhum billati hiya ahsan we, we hear this verse all the time. We understand what it means grammatically. We know that it is in order 
It is fi'l al-amr. When Allah says, ud'u, this is fi'l al-amr. In order, invite, call. To what? To the sabil rabbik What is the sabil rabbik The sabil rabbik is al-Islam. Bil-hikmah. What is al-hikmah? Sunnah and Quran. Wal mawa'idatun hasana. And good speech. Speech which you prepare and you deliver upon your convictions. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنِ And then listen to their arguments. Listen to what they have to say. And then after that, respond back to them with that which is better in its evidence, in its proof, and in its delivery. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to do. Verily, your Lord knows best those who go astray from his path, and he knows best those who are rightly guided. Those who go astray from his path, the mushrikeen, the kuffar, from among the Yahudi and the Ansar and the, and the Nasara, and Allah knows best those who's rightly guided from the Mu'mineen and the Muslimin. Allah He knows best. Now every Muslim need to ask themselves, for the time which I have lived in the Western world, just from that time, if I've been in Australia for a year and I came from there from another country, how long you've lived in the Western world, how long you've understood the English language, and I ask you the question, how many people have you yourselves spent the time deliberately with a plan, with conviction, to deliver the Islamic values? We didn't say to deliver an Islamic pamphlet. We didn't say to give a booklet. We didn't say to give a, a tape recording because this is not the real da'wah. This is a gesture. When you can't speak, when you can't establish a relationship, the least you can do is just put a piece of paper in somebody's hands. Put something in their mailbox. Reach in your glove compartment and give them a tape recording. Give them a booklet which was printed in India or Pakistan or Egypt or someplace else. Just give that to them and tell them, read this. This is not real dawah. This is what we call substitute dawah. The real dawah, it comes from the individual himself. Because it's a different kind of dawah. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first arrived in Medina, when the real da'wah began, because his level of da'wah in Mecca was one level. This was the primary level. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala giving to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just enough people to deliver him to another place where they will have the basis and the platform to do the real da'wah. So when they arrived in Medina, what do you think the first order of the Prophet hit was regarding the people of Medina? Here we have the, the Ansar and the Muhajirun. Radiallahu <coughs> anhum. What did the Prophet tell them to do? Did he say to them, Go about the streets of Medina to the Jews and the Christians and the Mushrikeen and the desert Arabs. Go and tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, that wasn't the first order he gave them. The first order he gave them was Tutaimu ta'am wa taqra salam man arafta wa man lam ta'arif. What kind of order is that? Share with them your food. Give the invitation and accept the invitation. This is what kind of order? This is a social order. It starts the basis of the da'wah. Give them good greetings and return to them good greetings. A social order which establishes the basis for da'wah. 
من عرفت whom you know ومن لم تعرف and whom you don't know now look at this here look at this here fundamental order and how it applies to us <coughs> how many muslims here since you have been in this country you actually make it your business your commitment to invite a non-Muslim, your colleague, your co-worker, or one of your neighbors to your house. How many of you make the effort every single week? You eat, you and your family, you eat together at least 15, 20 times a week, you and your family. If you eat by yourself, if you only have a wife, if you have children, you are eating two or three times a day, cooking your food. So I ask you, out of the 15 or 20 times a day, that, a week that you eat, how many have invited a non-Muslim to eat with them? One meal a week. And four times a week? Four times four weeks? 60 times a month. You eat by yourselves, you and your family. And of course, you eat from time to time with other Muslims. And how many times that you have eaten with other Muslims, did you take the time to invite one of your neighbors, one of your colleagues, or one of your co-workers to eat with you? This answer will tell you why we are suffering in our situation with misunderstanding. The second thing, how many of us come in and out of our homes and we don't speak to our neighbor at all. We see him, he sees us. Maybe we wave or we nod our head, that's it. We enter our home and we sit with our family and we eat our food. We get out of our home, we get in our cars and we go to our work or to our place of business and that's it. And we don't communicate. And we think to ourselves, we wonder to ourselves why the non-Muslims, they misunderstand us. They misunderstand us because we Muslims, we are concerned about ourselves. And not only are we concerned about ourselves, but even within the Muslims, within the Muslims, Somali for Somali, Sudani for Sudani, African for African, Lebanese for Lebanese, Pakistani for Pakistani. This is the way we are. Kullu hizbun bima ladayhi farihun. Every group for themselves. <coughs> and the only time we come together where there is some sense of unity is when we come to the mosque and we pray. That's it. How are we going to be understood by others when we have divisions among ourselves and how Islam is going to be understood by the others when we don't invite people to see Islam. We don't invite them to see Islam. And how we will get people to see Islam when our characters are blocking the way. You see, you would not know your mother even though you know your mother very well, if she's standing on the other side of, of a frosted window. You see, you call it the double glaze. If your mother is on the other side of a double glazed window, you could not see her because she will be distorted. But it's your mother. How you expect people to understand Islam? When those who are representing Islam, the Muslims, they're standing behind double glazed windows. And what is the double glazed window? It is our behavior. It is our behavior. Did you Muslims know that our Muslim brothers and sisters in the UK, in Australia, and other places, did you brothers know that the greatest amount of alcohol that is sold in the Western world, retail we're talking about, of course the Muslims, they don't produce the alcohol. 
the, the non-Muslims are smart enough now to know they produce it on a large level, but they know that Muslims are willing to sell it on a retail level. So the statistic, I tell you as a sociologist, the statistic is that in America, in Europe, I don't know Australia yet, but I would almost venture to say yes, it's here also. In America and in Europe, 62% of all the retail alcohol sold is sold by Muslims. <clears throat> and in the UK in particular, the highest percentage of drug selling, drug distribution, is among Muslims. And there are some cities in the UK where Muslims prostituting their own sisters. You can't believe it. You say, how is that? So this is our behavior. Not the behavior of all of us, obviously, but you and I, we pass by our Muslim brother selling haram, selling khanzir because he's selling to non-Muslims, selling alcohol because he's selling to non-Muslims, selling fawahish magazines because he's selling to non-Muslims, selling lottery tickets and other gambling devices. Why? Primarily He's selling it to non-Muslims. So since he's just selling to non-Muslims, never mind. We still say to him, Assalamu alaikum, akhi, kif halik, sheikh, alhamdulillah, mashallah, how's your family? And we meet them and we meet each other in the mosque to do our rituals. But outside of the mosque, we do not enjoin the right and we don't forbid the wrong. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us, the identification for this ummah is, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'maruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna ala al-munkar wa tu'minuna billah. The characteristic of this ummah is that we have been evolved, selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to represent the rest of the ummah, the rest of the nations, in what? In joining the right and forbidding the wrong. Now, the enjoining the right doesn't mean just simply speaking for the right. Enjoining the right means, as the Prophet ﷺ says, if any one of you see a munkar, you should do what? If you can, stop it with your hands. And if you cannot, because you are too weak, or you will create more fitna, or you have no authority to do so, then he said, do what? Bilisan. Speak. <coughs> and if you still feel weak, no authority, and you think it will create more fitna, which you cannot control, then he says, in your heart, but this is called Adhaf al-Iman, the weakest form or expression of faith. Most of us, we have chosen the weakest form anyway. So Islam is not represented properly. We Muslims, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the Western world as his representatives, we Muslims who Allah put in the Western world and gave us strength gave us good houses, gave us good food, put our children in good schools, gave us good health services, gave us good environment, allow us to build masjids, gave us the best environment, allow us to go back and forth to our homes, our countries, allow us to go to Hajj whenever we want to, allow us to have radio, television, newspaper, speak, tape recorder, DVD, anything we want to do in the Western world, we can do to promote Islam, but we don't do it. So who is there to blame? It is we, we Muslims.
we have to blame ourselves. And I say to you Muslims this, as a new Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have promised us that when we do not enjoin the right and we do not forbid the wrong, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will visit us with a calamity from himself. This is what his promise is. When the Muslims whom he has selected, they don't enjoin the right and they don't forbid the wrong, wheresoever they are, then Allah sends a special calamity on them from himself, which he designs. So that when they ask for his help, he doesn't answer them. And when they ask for relief from the oppression of their enemies, he doesn't help them. And so Muslims, we have right now a condition in the Muslim world where there are presently 14 Muslim countries that are under occupation. 14. Six of them, we have forgotten about them. They've been occupied so long. But eight of them occupied in the last 20 years. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he designed this from himself. Why? Because we Muslims, we don't enjoy the right. We don't forbid the wrong. And we don't do our responsibility. We have become like the Yahudis. We blame them. But we are practicing Islam in the same way that they are practicing their religion, as if it belonged to them. So you look at the Muslims, look at them. The Yahudis, what they do, they don't invite anybody to their religion, never. They leave the people to be misguided so they can be exploited. The Yahudis don't invite nobody because if they invite somebody, they don't want to split the money, the benefits. If they will invite somebody to their religion, they think, they will also have to share with them the benefits. There will be less people for them to exploit. So they don't invite nobody because they believe that their hearts are the wrappings of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muslims, we believe we have the Quran, we have the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We have Islam. But we don't invite anybody because we believe that this religion, this is for us. And so, because that is our thinking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing to us. No, no. <coughs> if you don't do your job, Allah will replace you with another people. And Muslims are being replaced by another people. Not Khalid. He's not one of the people. Some people much better. The Muslims are being replaced. You should think for yourself. What is your place in this society? What is your reason for being here in this society? What justification do you have to be in this society? What you will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment about being among these people? For what reason you came among these people? You came to benefit? You come to get their asylum? To get their protection? To get their education? To benefit from their standard of uh, living? What you came for? All of this is okay if also along with that you are delivering the goods because you came here as a messenger. All Muslims from the other Muslim countries, all Muslims, they are just like ambassadors. You have been sent by Allah to this place to deliver his message. So what would you think about a person sent by a king 
as an ambassador to go to a people and deliver a message. But when that man got there, he found everything was so nice there, he just decided to stay there with those people, not even deliver his message. So that king, maybe he has to send someone after that person to arrest him, wake him up, and remind him that he was sent to those people to deliver a message. Oh, Muslims, don't wait for death to visit you. Don't wait for some wrath to come to us, because only two things can happen to us Muslims here in this country or America, or the UK. God forbid, God forbid that some situation happens that Muslims are blamed for, <coughs> which can happen any day. I honestly, in my heart, from my investigation, from what I know, I don't believe that Muslims themselves were principally responsible for September 11th. I don't believe it. Maybe some Muslims were indirectly through their intention, Allahu A'lam. But from all intents and purposes and investigations, from the intelligence community, from the security community, from the technological community, from the diplomatic community, all intents and purposes, it leads to the fact that a rogue operation took place and that Muslims took the rap. And I do believe it will not stop. Some other situation is going to take place and Muslims will take the rap. Only thing, the results may be far worse than what happened in the aftermath of September 11th. Your freedom and my freedom the level of luxury or enjoyment which you have in speech and moving about, it may soon disappear. Then what will we say then? We won't have the chance to do da'wah. Nobody will want to listen to our da'wah. Oh, Muslims, you and I have a special opportunity. <coughs> we are here in the West where the sentiments against Islam are the strongest. But we have the best position to change those sentiments. My brother, he said that, and I don't take the, the credit for it for this, he said that our organizations or our work has produced over 5,000 shahadas. Exactly. The figure is actually about 11,000. But this is not the real issue. Because I learned a long time ago that if Allah wants to guide somebody, he guides them. Not because of you, but he guides them because he wants them to be guided. But what I discovered a long time ago is not the people who enter Islam, it is the people whose hearts change about Muslims. It's called the allies. If 11,000 people came into Islam, I tell you 40,000, their idea and feeling about Islam and Muslims have changed. When I talk to 100 non-Muslims, I expect each time five, six, or seven of them take shahada just like that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the heart of the human beings ready and waiting just like that. If there's 100 non-Muslims here, if they were here today, if they are here tomorrow, I will guarantee you almost somewhere between 3 to 11 or 12 will become Muslims, just like that. That means on the average, 5 or 6 out of every 100 will take shahada, just like that. Not because of Khalid, but because they are empty and they are confused and their life has been destroyed. The non-Muslim in the West their family had been destroyed. The alcoholism, the drug, drug addiction in the West is so prevalent that in every family, every single family, there are at least three or four or five 
drug addicts, and alcoholics in every family. 2.8 million people just in the Western world shoot themselves in the head or cut their throats or cut their wrists or jump off a bridge every year, commit suicide because they're empty. They don't eat at the table anymore, so the family is destroyed. They don't take care of the young, do not take care of the old, and the old, they don't take care of the young. So Allah has removed rahmah from them. The fathers have no respect among the children, and the children care nothing for the fathers and mothers. So Allah has removed from them the feeling of family. So we don't have to do anything to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing them himself. So they are empty. They don't have any answers. If you ask them about the values of life, about the conditions, about death, about the purpose of life, if you ask them the principles, they don't know how to answer. But we have the answers. So I find that when I talk to non-Muslims, I first talk to them just about life, not religion. And after we talk about life and they start to think to themselves, yeah, I agree, you're right. I like the way you explain that point. That's a good answer. Where do you get that answer from? I said, this comes from a, a sacred scripture. They said, what, what, what scripture is that? I said, it's called Quran. I said, you know, we, we say, say when we eat, when I'm eating, I said, Bismillah. I said, Alhamdulillah. I said, what's that? I said, Alhamdulillah. I said, what is that? I said, we, I praise to Allah. So why you say that? Because our messenger Muhammad, وسلم, he said, we should be grateful. So when we eat and we drink, we say, Alhamdulillah. And before we do so, we say, Bismillah. He said, what is it, Bismillah? I said, this means in the name of God, before we start anything. He said, that's, I, yeah, I agree with that. That's good. As we begin to talk, day in, day out, my, my neighbor, my colleague, my co-worker, as we begin to talk about life and different things, he starts to see that the principles and the behaviors from the Prophet وسلم, and from Allah subhanahu wa is much stronger than his. He wants to know, well, what is that book? Who is that man Muhammad وسلم, you're talking about? And what is this life you call about Islam? In a matter of time, when he compares what he has, when he makes the comparison, anybody that has a clean glass of water and a dirty glass of water, which one you think he'll drink from? Any human being has a clean glass, there's a dirty glass. But if he has no clean glass and there's only dirty water, what do you think he will drink? He will drink the dirty water which is in front of him. But when the clean water is put side by side, which one do you think he will take? Every time he will take it. But we Muslims, we're not giving them the option. And so for every one person that becomes a Muslim, I tell you, that there is another five or six people whose ideas about Islam, Quran, Muhammad وسلم, and Muslims have changed. And they go back to their jobs. They go back to their families. They go back to their school. And when someone says that, Muhammad, that Muslims worship Muhammad, وسلم, they say, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. <coughs> when they say that, Muslims follow have a special God called Allah and they don't like Christians and Jesus. They say you're crazy. You don't even know what you're talking about. Say so the Muslims in their book called the Quran, they hate all other people. They say no, that's incorrect. I have read the Quran myself. That's not true. So what have they become? They have become an ally. Most Muslims they are expecting that if they talk to a non-Muslim for a day or a week or a year, somehow or another you think if they don't become a Muslim, later for him. Forget him. He's a kafir, she's a kafir. They don't want to listen. Forget them. Yet our prophet, Nuh alayhi salam, Allah sent him giving da'wah as a prophet with wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 950 years. And he only got a handful of people. But you and I, 
We want to shake and bake. <laughs> if we give if we give dawah for if we give dawah to somebody for a whole month, that's it. I don't talk to him no more. <laughs> I gave him pamphlets. I gave him books. I gave him a tape. I talked to him for 20 minutes. That's it. Finished. He's a kafir. I'm not talking to him anymore. That's how Muslims. Yet, O oh Muslims, the non-Muslims, they don't feel that way about you and your children. <coughs> if you have cable in your house, you have at least 189 channels. And if you have satellite, you have access to 700 channels. And here in Australia, none of those channels belong to Muslims. And through the television more so than anything else, your children, your wives have access to all the filth that they want to put in your home and they never give up. But we Muslims, what do we spend? What do we do? How much time, how much commitment do we make? I say to you Muslims this, that the work of one man, whether it's uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat or Yusuf Butkus or Zakia Naik or uh, anyone else who is prominent in giving da'wah is not enough. We don't need heroes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never gave us any orders in the Quran individually except he said, ku anfusikum. All the orders Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in the Quran is always jama'ah. Aqimu salat wa atu zakat. All throughout the Quran, Allah is ordering us jama, together, united, because it takes a united effort to do the work that we want to do. The individual effort, it's gone. Khalid will die. Sheikh Ahmed Didat is right now, he's in a coma. His work is done. Others will be gone. And while we are fixing our minds upon heroes, personalities, all of us are losing the opportunity to do the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And brothers and sisters, I don't know how many Muslims there are in Australia, but I'll tell you what. If every Muslim in Australia who is an adult, if you gave, if you gave da'wah and you succeeded in making five allies a year, and they, baby, you gave one shahada every five years. In a matter of 10 years, there will be 8 million people who would be allies, and there will be 2 million people that would be Muslims. Now you think about that. Just if you gave, made a commitment to this dawah. And what does it mean? You don't have to take a dawah course. You don't have to read a lot of pamphlets and booklets. No, you set aside 20 minutes a day on your job when you sit down to eat lunch with your co-workers. Talk to them about life. And through that talk about life, bring them through the window of Islam. Your neighbor, speak to your neighbor. When you see your neighbor washing his car, go out there and help him. Ask him, do you need a brush? Do you need a sponge? Do you need a towel? Can I help you out? And he will ask you, no, that's okay. Why you want to do that? I can do it myself. No, no, we're neighbors. I have to help you. And you do it sincerely. And so what will happen? Just through your offering, your help to your neighbor, just through your good word to your neighbor, asking your neighbor, how is your wife and your children? Can we share our food with you? Can you come and visit us? If you know that your neighbor is sick, you don't see him come out of the house. You see his car in front of his house. He doesn't come out to work. You know, you ask, and his wife says he's ill. Why you don't go and visit him? Oh, Muslims, your neighbor, your colleague, your co-worker, can be tomorrow Waliul Hamim. They can become an ally for us. And even if they don't become Muslims, 
at least they can be people who themselves will say, I know Abdullah. He's a good man. I know his family. They're a good, clean family. And I know what they believe. I don't know much about their religion, but they don't drink. They don't drugs. They never curse. They have very good manners. They are about accomplishment. They are about principle. Every time I meet him, he has good word. He has a good smile. He's always inviting me to his house. I never go, but he's always inviting me. And when I was ill and my wife was ill, they came to the hospital. They came to visit us. And when my children went to play in his house, the house is always clean. And they, I don't know how they do it. Every time they're praying five or six times a day, I don't know how they do it. So the Muslim develops a reputation in his neighborhood that he's concerned. But in our neighborhoods, Muslims, our reputation is just the opposite. Muslims are not concerned about nothing except their own house and their own mosque and their own group. All Muslims, if you ask me as a new Muslim, how can we do the work of da'wah? I say, through reforming your behavior. Reforming your behavior towards your neighbor, your, co your co-worker, your colleagues. That's first. When you reform your behavior, understand that Muslims are being watched all the time, not by the government. You're being watched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're being watched by your neighbors and the other people. And in many cases, what people think about Islam, did you know that most of what people think about Islam is really what they think about Muslims? So we Muslims, we need to remove ourselves from being an obstruction to Islam. And we need to put ourselves in the place of being a facility for Islam. And if there are 100 Muslims in this room, 100 in this room, who will give 30 minutes of their time a week, not a month, not a day, but a week, 30 minutes of their time to think about this issue. Think about this issue. And then apply this issue. And talk about this issue with their children, with their wives, with their family, with other Muslims. If there are 100 Muslims who do that, I will guarantee you, just here, you will make a significant change in how people think about Islam and what people think about Muslims. And secondly, you will find that among the people in this room here, you are representing a greater body of people. Who are they? Your colleagues? your co-workers, your neighbors. There are at least 5,000 people that are connected to us that's in this room here, one way or another, 5,000. 5,000. If you change your attitude, you change your demeanor, you change your behavior, we will affect positively a greater number of those 5,000. That's our job. We cannot do more than that, and Allah doesn't expect more of that from us. O Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best judge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he calls us to reform our behavior. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he causes us to become a reflection for this deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he put in our hearts a concern for others besides ourselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we Muslims can modify that we can modify the distinction that we put, that we, the distinctions that we put between ourselves based upon where we come from. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we Muslims show some sign of unity and discipline outside of the mosque, which we show when we come here to pray. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Muslims take the Quran from the shelf and the Muslims take the Quran and take it with them and that the Muslims open the Qur'an for others to read it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also that Muslims, that they think to themselves what obligation that they have for the new Muslims, because a new Muslim is faced with a big problem. 
Sometimes the problem a new Muslim has when they become a Muslim is greater than the problem they had before they became Muslims. Because when a person becomes a Muslim, alhamdulillah, he becomes saved from one thing. But when he becomes a Muslim, then he comes into a whole nother set of confusion. He has to sift out Islam from the Muslim baggage. He has to find out the difference between what is Islam and what is the cultural baggage of the Muslims. Secondly, he comes into Islam from his family, from her husband, from his wife. He comes into Islam. And when he comes into Islam, now the wife or the husband or the family says, you are a complete fool. We will never speak to you again. Get out of our house. And what does that person have now? Those Muslims who hugged them the night before, who said how great it is for you to be a Muslim, they don't open up their home. They don't open up their pockets. They don't offer these new Muslims anything. So the new Muslim has to go for themselves. And for me, I spent 12 years, the first 12 years of being a Muslim, reading all the books I could find inside the bookstores. And you know what, that, what happened there. I followed about six or seven different paths. And by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, by His grace, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave me some guidance. But it took 10, 12 years of traveling all around and reading all the books. And I'd say eight out of the 10 books I read was all cultural baggage. But this is what we have to go through. But if the Muslims who are already Muslim, if someone becomes a Muslim in your midst, if you take care of him or take care of her, take the responsibility that they're almost like your family, like they're like your client, and you take care of them, then you will find as people come into Islam, they will become very strong. They'll be a compliment to your family. They'll be a compliment to your community. And I already told you that it's much easier. It would be much easier for an Australian-born person. When they become a Muslim, it is much easier for them to go and talk to other Australian people. Much easier. If you want to know how you can accept, how you can facilitate Islam, teach a new Muslim. Support a new Muslim. Embrace a new Muslim. Because these new Muslims have a greater capacity, easier facility to spread Islam than those who are born Muslim in other places. This is what we find. O Muslims, you are the ambassadors of Islam. Allah will ask you about the responsibility He has placed in your hands. We are the indigenous people, whether from America or from the UK or from Australia, the indigenous people. Allah will give us the responsibility of taking the Islam to our families and the other indigenous people. You cannot do it without us, and we cannot do it without you. If we will unite our resources together, you will see there is no group of Muslims in the whole world who have an opportunity like we have in the Western world. I don't know another group of Muslims that have the freedom to speak, to act, to live, to own, to organize, to teach with the resources like we have that Allah has given to us. And he has said in the Quran, razaqnahum yunfikun. He will hold you responsible for what? He has given you. وَأَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ يَا اللَّهُ غَفُرُ الرَّحِيمِ بِرَحْمِكِ يَا أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِمِينَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمْ وَبِهَمْدِكُ وَنَشَادُ وَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتْ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُكُ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ A question came, said, it's not an excuse, but how can we as Muslims stand for ourselves among all of this media and publicity attack?
You know, I say uh, to the Muslims that if you watch TV, if you sit and you watch a couple of hours of Al Jazeera every day, this is your fault. It's your fault. Because they make their money showing us bad pictures. Hardly any good pictures about Muslims, even when Muslims have TV. Because the money is in bad media. So we Muslims have to find a way to develop media that will give us inspiration, media that will provide us with education, media that will provide us with explanations, media that provide our children with edutainment, meaning that which educates them and entertains them at the same time. So if you don't spend your time or your money or make a sacrifice for an alternative, then we have what is given to us. The second thing is, we cannot say that, we cannot say that Muslims are simply being bombarded with bad media. No, that's true. But the very fact that the brother made this announcement today means we have, there is somebody, even within government, who says, you Muslims, deserve the opportunity to have your own platform. Now, if you don't take the opportunity to have your own platform, then whose fault is it that you and your children and we and our children are bombarded by the people who take advantage of the platform? Sister says, I'm a new Muslim who came to Islam through your DVDs. I feel strongly to do a video of why we women wear hijab. Well, sister, inshallah, I will say this to you. Uh, if you will um, contact us while we are here through uh, One Islam, through the Imam, or through our Sheikh Ismail, uh, we will see to it that uh, your interest to do uh, uh, a documentary or an interview about the importance of hijab, inshallah, sister, we'll see to it that uh, the platform is made available for you to do that, inshallah. May Allah reward you for that. Uh, a sister, she said, please explain some types of cultural baggage. Cultural baggage. Cultural baggage means the habits, the traditions that Muslims bring from their country, which has nothing to do with Islam at all. Cultural baggage. The Arabs have their cultural baggage. The Africans have their cultural baggage. The people in the Indo-Pakistan continent, they have their cultural baggage. The people in Indonesia, South Africa, Malaysia, they have their cultural baggage. And what is the cultural baggage? It is the traditions which those people have developed alongside of Islam. And so, when you go to those countries, you find in many cases, Muslims doing the same thing that Hindus do in their weddings in their celebrations. You see them doing the same things, which has nothing to do with Islam, but when they come to this country or another country and you go to their wedding, you find the customs have nothing to do with the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. It is cultural baggage. <laughs> Muslims who come from one particular place and because of the dress they wear, a new Muslim becomes a Muslim, they say, you have to wear this. This is cultural baggage. Um, our lady became Muslim the other day from Perth. She said she had been reading the Quran for two years, wanting to be a Muslim for two years. But some sisters told her, unless she wore all the clothes and cover herself, she cannot be a Muslim. So when she became a Muslim, she said, what if I had died? What if I had died? This cultural baggage. So Muslims have to be careful that what we offer to other people is only from the Quran and only from the Sunnah, not from their culture. Or you should tell people, uh, this is something we do in our country. And it's not against the Quran. But it is something we do. 
So I just want to be honest with you, this is not a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu you don't have to do it. You don't have to wear a kufi if you don't want to. You don't have to do this or that if you don't want to. It's better for you if you do. I think it's better if you do. It will help you to be identified or whatever, but you don't have to. The first thing, change your manners. Change your behavior. Believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Accept the Prophet Sallallahu and read from the Quran and from the Sunnah. A sister said, when you talk to non-Muslims about Islam, what do we do when they react badly or negatively? You be patient. You be patient, that's all. Everybody's not going to jump up and down and clap because you give them da'wah. Everybody's not going to agree with you. Allah sent prophets and messengers who gave da'wah better than you and I, and the people spit on them, threw rocks at them, persecute them, kill their followers, put them in prison. You and I, Nobody's putting us in prison here. Hardly anyone is going to spit at you just because you talk to them, throw rocks at you. No, you be patient with them. Smile at them. Talk to them another day. And don't return back to them what they say. Be patient. Because when the Prophet them passed by some people and they said to him, Sama alayk. Death be upon you. And Aisha radiallahu anha was with the Prophet sallam. She was a very spirited woman. And she said, and death be on you and your family and your tribe. <laughs> and the Prophet sallam said, oh Aisha, don't say that. Just say to them, Sam alayk. I'm just saying to them, wa, wa, wa alaykum, and on you. If you want to say something, say that. But don't say what they say. Don't return back to them that kind of greeting. Here the Prophet Sallallahu is giving Aisha radiallahu anha a lesson in patience. Because the Prophet Sallallahu was that kind of man that he used to suffer the indignation of others, the insult of others to get the opportunity that one day he could visit them, talk with them. Like the man who used to come by the house of the Prophet Sallallahu every day and uh, he'd keep his trash until he passed by the Prophet Sallallahu house and dump the trash in front of his door. And one of the companions one day was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu and that man did that. And they got up to slap him. And the Prophet said, no, leave him. Just clean the trash up. And so one day, that man, he didn't come to the Prophet's house, and he asked, where is that man? He said, he's sick, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right away, the Prophet got up and went to his house, knock on the door. His wife came to the door. He said, I'd like to see your husband. She went inside. She said, Muhammad is here to see you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, let him in. When the Prophet came in, he said, how are you? I'm missing you. The man said, why you come and see me? You don't know I don't like you? You don't know I'm your enemy? The Prophet Sallallahu said, yes, I know that. But you, you're also my neighbor. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told us, we have to be concerned about the neighbor. So I came to visit you for that reason. That man became a Muslim. And in the battle of the trench, he fought beside the Prophet Sallallahu This is the manner of the Prophet Sallallahu We Muslims, we don't have no patience. We think that because we have good answer, because we're good people, the people are supposed to listen to us, accept from us. No, be patient. In time, they will change. It says, when our non-Muslim colleagues invite us to a party in their homes where drinking is done, are we supposed to go, given that um, um, these are, because we're supposed to accept the invitation? No, I tell you, you have to use your own discretion. I have family members. They drink. They listen to music. If they invite me to come to their house, what should I say? No, no, no. I'm not, I can't come to your house because you people are drink. Because it's your Thanksgiving, you got a turkey on the table because you got a Christmas tree in the living room.
because it's a birthday party. I cannot come. So when can I come then? No. I use my discretion. I say if they're drinking over there in that room over there, I go sit in that room over there. If they're sitting around the table and there's wine or alcohol on the table, I will tell them, oh, you can serve me over here. I, I don't mind to sit over here. They say, why are you? No, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't uh, sit at the table where there's alcohol. I don't prefer to do that. Oh, don't, no worry. We, we take the alcohol away. Because once you tolerate them, they will start to respect you. But if you don't tolerate them, you don't visit them, you are so righteous, you can only, they, you want them to come into your house, but you can never come into their house. You want them to come to the masjid, but you cannot go to the church. You think about it, Muslims. How many of you have ever been to a church? Oh, you say, Astaghfirullah. Out of how the shaykh, he asking us to go to the church. I didn't say go to the church and worship with them. I said, go there and sit with them. If they invite you, sit with them. And then they will ask you, what do you think? Tell them, say, I'd like to tell you what I think. They will give you a chance to talk. And I always tell the story, how five churches came together and invite me to talk to them. And so there's 380 of them in a church, big church. And once the minister, he saw that I got them to agree that there's not much difference between Isa ibn Maryam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi Not much difference between Quran and what Allah sent his prophet sallallahu alayhi with. And that we all have to believe in the monotheism and Ibrahim alayhi salam. And as they start to agree in with me, he said, hold it. I think the time is up. <laughs> Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Yasin. I think the time is up for today, and uh, we, we'll invite you back another time. So the people, they said, wait a minute. We want to hear more. So he said, okay, uh, you can go downstairs in the basement. There's another area down there. So 140 people come down in the basement, and we talk for another two hours. 96 of those people, when I asked them, do you bear witness there's none to be worshipped except Allah? They said, yes. And what I told you about this man, Muhammad Wasallam, is he different from Isa and Maryam? Is he a prophet of God? They say, yes. But don't tell the preacher. <laughs> inside, inside their church. <coughs> but we Muslims, we so righteous, we so Muslim, we don't go to them. We can't sit in their houses, but they can sit in ours. We can't go to the church, but they can come to the mosque. You think about it, Muslims. You think it's a one-way street? It's not a one-way street. You have to give, they got to give. So it's give and take. Everybody have to give and take. It's a two-way street. Umar ibn al-Khattab, you are not better than him. And when he entered Jerusalem as a victor, the one conquering as a ruler, what did he do? He purposely went to the church. <coughs> and he faced in a direction other than where the, where the idols or the crosses was at, and he prayed there to show them that their places are also sacred in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah mentioned in the Quran, and in the verse where he mentioned, he mentioned the churches and the synagogues and the mosques in that order. Church, synagogue, mosque, and other places where the name of Allah is mentioned. So it means their places have legitimacy, although we don't go there for ibadah. I don't go to the church for ibadah. But if they give me the opportunity to talk to them inside the church, I'd rather talk to them inside the church than to talk to them anywhere else. So we Muslims, we have to think about it, especially the non-Muslims, I mean the new Muslims. If you get the opportunity to go talk to your family members and you tell them, I can't come sit down with you because you're drinking alcohol, I can't come to the birthday party, I can't come to the Thanksgiving dinner, I can't come to the, 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 the Christmas dinner, I can't do this, I can't do that. So what can you do with your family members now? You, took, you change your clothes, you change your name, you cut yourself off from them, so what 
do you want them to think? No, we can't do that. We have to open our doors and we have to accept their invitation. The Prophet وسلم, he was poisoned when? Was he poisoned in a Muslim's house? Jewish. Have the Prophet وسلم, go to a Jewish person's house? Did he ask that Jewish lady, is this meat halal? Did he ask her? But we Muslims, you come to my house and you ask me, brother, is this meat halal? <laughs> Subhanallah. <laughs> no, the Prophet وسلم, he kept his door open and he also got up and he went to the invitations. And uh, I remind you, in Mecca, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the order prohibiting the alcohol, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to sit with some of his companions and he did not like it, they were drinking. But he let them. He didn't like it. He frowned on it. He used to sit away from them. But he sat with them because if he was to just sit away from them, isolate himself, how he will mix with them, how he will teach them, how they will learn from him. We Muslims, we cannot isolate ourselves from the rest of the people just because we have better habits or better knowledge than them. No. We have to tolerate them to a certain degree. And as you mix with those people, you'll find out. After a while, they say, hey, hey, wait a minute. Don't smoke no cigarette here. Abdullah, he don't like that. Don't, don't curse. You know, Abdullah, he don't curse. No, 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 no. We can't serve no, hey, Abdullah, come to our house. No pork. We, we, everything is ha Abdullah. I went and bought from the store down the street. Halal. I bought the meat. It's halal, Abdullah. They will start to make the concessions for us because they respect us, because we mix with them. But if we don't mix with them, we don't tolerate them, why should they make concessions for us? Look what the brother said. The country took the tax money, tax dollars. How do you think the non-Muslim feel about that? that they give some of the tax dollars to the Muslims to spread Islam. Subhanallah. The sister says, I'm reading most from the sisters first because they usually get the last. Said, with reference to interfaith dialogue, what in your opinion uh, should we do? I, I, I don't, to be honest, sister, I don't um, participate much in this whole thing about interfaith. No, I, I don't mix with them for them to teach me about their faith and me give them a little about that faith and then sit down and have some cookies and, and the tea. No. If they give me opportunity to, to explain about Islam, I go. Because already I know about their religion. So the Prophet saw them, he did not sit with them for them to teach him about the religion. And then he teach them something and they pat each other on the back and, and then eat some cookies and... Uh... No. No. Our position is that we have the Dalil. We have Tawheed. We have Risala. We have Sharia. We have it. And we will tolerate to listen to them, but we're listening to them in order to get the chance to give them the proper Dalil. But if the basis of us coming together is to share each other's faith, this is another issue. For me, my opinion is. I don't want to sit with the people as if we just put Islam and Christianity and Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism and this and that and feminism and homosexualism and that and so on and just spread it around and listen to everybody around the room. No, we come with a specific purpose. That we are Muslims and we are representing the Prophet وسلم, the final messenger with the final revelation and the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we want to explain our position. That's what, we, that's, what, that's what I do. I don't uh, sit with the people to uh, sit around the room and make it appear as if all of that is uh, legitimate. This is called Wahdud uh, al-Adyan. Uh, the sheikh, he will know what that means. Wahdud al-Adyan. To create the idea in the minds of people that all the religions, if we respect them, can become one. No, Allah says, Inna dina inda Allah al-Islam. So we don't believe in this whole idea of uh, bringing together all the religions, trying to make them one. No, we tolerate everyone, 
in order to get the opportunity to give them the proofs and giving them evidence. And Allah, he knows the best, inshallah. Says, how do we differentiate the parts uh, in the English translation of Quran that say not to take Christians, Jews as friends? This is awliya. It doesn't mean that you don't have relationship with them. The Prophet Sallallahu he did business with Jews and Christians, didn't he? It's not taking them. What the friendship here means, taking them into your intimacy, using them as a dalil, using them as a wakil, taking them into your intimacy, taking their advice on religious matters, dressing like them, acting like them. And what it means, dressing like them means purposely dressing like them out of their desires of their dressing designs. No. We don't take them as friends and protectors in this way. But it does not mean that we don't do business with them. It doesn't mean we don't smile with them. It doesn't mean we don't be nice to them. This is not what the Quran means. For if that were the case, I remind you that when the Prophet wasallam passed away, he had a debt with a Jew. And there was an occasion when a Jew came to the Prophet وسلم, in his mosque demanding his money for a debt. Which means what? The Prophet وسلم, he was taking loan and doing business from Christians and Jews in Medina. And he was honoring that. So they was, he was doing that to show that we can do business with anybody. We can interact with anybody. We can live among anybody. We can be gentle and kind towards anybody. We can smile and have good behavior towards anybody. We can shake the hands of anyone. We can deal with anyone. We can sit with them. We can talk with them. We can eat with them. And for us men, even, we can marry them. Because the Prophet wasallam, he had a wife from whom? Jewish. And he had a wife from whom? From Nasara. Sure, they become Muslims. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows this example. So we Muslims, we cannot be isolationists. And when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, don't take the Christians and Jews as friends and protectors, it means don't take them into our intimacy, using them as uh, our advisors, using them as our models, using them as our guides, and for them to be showing us and pattering for us the way to live. Allah, he knows the best. Says, it has been said that it is haram to have dinner at a table where alcohol is served. I think I answered that already. It says, please explain some types of... Okay, I answered that already. So now the sisters, they cannot uh, blame me because I answered all of the questions they sent so far. So now I will answer some of the questions to the best of my ability. Uh, I, uh, brother, this is Subhi, especially for you, inshallah. Uh, I will answer some of the questions from the brothers now so the sisters, they cannot complain. Alhamdulillah. Uh, it says, uh, I strongly uh, agree with the necessity of da'wah, but I don't have the skill. How do I achieve this? I mentioned to you, inshallah, first, deal with the simple things. Don't think the skill is in the kalam. No, the skill, maybe somebody else is the best talker. What you do is, you provide maybe the environment. You provide the environment. The brothers who, who are part of the Jamaat Tabligh, uh, uh, they know about that. Somebody, maybe he's the Ragba. Another brother, he's the Mutakallam. Another brother, he acts as the Amir. So if you got a little group of brothers that do Dawah, maybe you're not the Mutakallam. You don't talk well. You don't have good English. You didn't read the books. You don't know the techniques. Okay, then, you be the facilitator. You drive the brothers around. You will get the same rewards they get. You sit and you listen. Another brother, he just sit and he listen. And when he think that he can say something, no, brother, look, it's better I here. Oh, brother, here, look, Sunda, they tell him this here over here. So you, one brother, he, he, he resourceful. Another one, he drives. Another one, he speaks. Everybody can do something. Come and ask this brother here, what can we do to utilize this 35,000? Ask, can we set up a classroom? Can we set up a press? Can we deliver that to one Islam so they can make some programs? What can we do? And you will find that if you take the time and you sit with people and talk, 
you'll find something to do, inshallah. Say, so what is the proper approach to give dawah to those that have been uh, assimilated? Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by those who have been assimilated. Maybe you mean Muslims who have been assimilated. We don't give dawah to Muslims. Dawah is to non-Muslims. We give tarbiyah to Muslims. We give nasiha to Muslims. We give guidance, irshad, to Muslims. We don't extend to Muslims, we don't call Muslims to Iman. Muslims already have Iman. Even if their Iman is weak, they already have kalima la ilaha illallah. We call the people who themselves, they don't have the kalima. We call them. This is what classically da'wah means. When the Prophet ﷺ sent his companions out to some people in the case of Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, when he sent them to the Yemen, he didn't send them to the Yemen to those people who was already Muslims in the Yemen. He sent them to the people who was non-Muslims. When Allah told us to call to the way of your Lord, he didn't mean call Muslims to the way of your Lord. He means call the non-Muslims. That's what it means classically. But if you mean going to talk to Muslims to themselves who have fallen off the path, give them nasiha. Educate them. Inspire them. Advise them. Guide them. Teach them. This is what we do for Muslims. More, subhanAllah. Okay, I, I take this and I answer a few from the brothers. Sin, when would the wrath of Allah come on the non-Muslims as leaders in the work or, must, or the... I'm sorry. What should the Muslim organizations in Australia do about this? Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll answer this in general, inshallah. But I understand this, uh, this question to be. Uh, she says, when would the wrath of Allah come on to the non-Muslims as leaders? Uh, of course, I, I say to the brothers and sisters this, that the leaders are always more responsible than the followers. But at the same token, we cannot just blame the leaders and say, the leaders of the Muslim countries this, and the leaders of the mosque this. In most cases, Allah gives you the leaders that you deserve. If we see something wrong in our leaders, we go and talk to them ourselves if we can. And you cannot blame your, you don't have any tyrants. One thing about the leaders that's in Australia, and the leaders that's in America, and the leaders that's in the UK, they're not tyrants. Because they're not representing any government. If we don't want to listen to them, you know what we do after the Salah, we just don't listen. So how much blame can you make for the Muslim leaders if you yourself don't advise them and if you yourself don't support them? Support the leader, how you can support him. You advise him. The Prophet Sallallahu said, when Allah wants good for a leader, he gives him people that if he wants to do something good, they support him. And if he does something other than that, they advise him. And if he wants something for him other than that, he gives them people that when he wants to do something good, they don't help him. And when he does something other than that, they don't wake him up. They don't advise him. So we cannot blame the leaders. We have to support them, advise them, be present with them. Someone says, what I don't understand is, how is it Islam is there in India only to learn? A... Maybe you can tell me what that means. Well, if that's what it means, um, I'll tell you, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbul Mashriqeen wa Rabbul Maghribain. Allah is the Lord of the two east and the two west, means that he's the Lord of every place and point on this earth. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only intended for Islam to be in India, then probably all of us should be in India. No, Islam is where you are, and the knowledge is where you are, and there are knowledgeable people every place. You should take advantage of the knowledgeable people where you are, because it is the responsibility of a person seeking knowledge to seek all of the knowledge he can where he is, or where she is, before they move and go some other place. When you cannot obtain a certain piece of knowledge, you can go anywhere to get it, said the Prophet Most of us, 
Most of us have available to us knowledge right where we are, but we don't particularly like who gives it to us. So if I'm from India, I don't want to learn from an Arab. If I'm from Arab, I don't want to learn from a Pakistani. If I'm an African, I don't want to learn from an Arab. So this is something different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has put knowledgeable people, ulama and fuqaha in every place. If you go to Scandinavia, there is the alam there. You go to Germany, there is an alam there. Every place, there is ulama and fuqaha. Maybe they are not of the nationality you like. Maybe they're not the persuasion which you like. But knowledge is not like that. We don't put the knowledge. We don't put the, we don't put the, the country. We don't put the ethnicity. We don't even put the name of the person before the knowledge. If it's knowledge which we're seeking, we go to a person and we want to know what knowledge it is they have, and we seek to, se to secure that knowledge, and that is the most important for us. A uh, person said, would the attempt to establish institutions such as Islamic banking be considered uh, an approach to da'wah. Well, no, I don't think. I think that uh, for Muslims to look into the issue of Islamic banking is to, is to improve uh, their social and uh, uh, their social and economic situation here that be based more upon uh, halal sources. But this is not an issue, I don't think, directly about da'wah. It says, is there any opportunity for you to lecture on the Gold Coast? Uh, I don't know where the Gold Coast is, but if it's in Australia, I don't mind to go there, inshallah. <laughs> It, for me, the goal is every place there's the opportunity to give da'wah, inshallah. So, assalamu alaikum. Uh, what made you revert to Islam from Christianity? Alhamdulillah, may you grow in strength. Uh, all I can say, um, uh, the brother who, who wrote this, is uh, I don't have a special story, to be honest with you. Uh, in 1965, uh, I had the opportunity to be exposed to a Muslim who sat me down and uh, explained some issues to me. Uh, I was already believing in God, but I was very confused. Um, and this person sat me down, Alhamdulillah gave me the opportunity, and in two hour period of time, uh, SubhanAllah, I never heard anybody to answer questions like that, and I became a Muslim, Alhamdulillah. That's, uh, I, can, I, can't, I can't say it more than that because uh, there's no real drama attached to it. I thank Allah SWT for that opportunity. What about the Tablighi Jama'ah? Are they doing a good job? Alhamdulillah. All the different groups of Muslims are doing a special job. And so uh, I, began, I began my initial work and exposure with this group of brothers. Alhamdulillah. My teacher was from this group of brothers. I've been to Raiwen. I did my chilla there. For those of you who know what that is. Alhamdulillah. So what can I say? But I can say this. They had something which I benefited from, but there was other things they did not have which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he let me get from other places. So I say to Muslims, get the knowledge wherever you can get it from, uh, and then after you, you obtain it, uh, say what is good or keep quiet. So that's all I can say. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless those brothers and the work which they are doing, and uh, that part of it we don't agree with, we don't agree, but we respectfully disagree. And, uh, and uh, if you cannot get knowledge from one place, get it from another place. If you find better knowledge than what they have, get that knowledge from the better place. But don't speak bad about Muslims. And don't make the judgments, inshallah. So one thing is to invite to Islam uh, to reverse the situation. My question is, should we kill our rulers? <laughs> Uh, this is a very fundamental question, uh, in, uh, in spite of the fact um, this is probably from a young man. This is probably from a young man. And the older man told me, you show me a young man, I'll show you a fool. <laughs> now, it's not a fool who wrote the question, but it's obviously a person who is immature, a person that is angry, a person that is a reactionary, a person who thinks that the only way that we can change something, maybe we kill the unbelievers or we kill the rulers. Well, if we kill all the rulers, who will rule in their place? 
You ask yourself the question. If we go and we kill all the Muslim rulers who you think are tyrants, who will rule in their place? The same people who will kill them will want to rule in their place. And what will they do? They will do most of what those rulers are doing. Because the issue here is not that if you had the chance to, do, to sit in their place, you're going to do something different. No, it's not necessarily so. No, our position is that we don't kill the rulers. That's not what the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi teaches us. A man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Imam is a fasiq. Should we throw him out? Should we pray behind him? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No, you cannot throw him out. You must pray behind him. Prayer is incumbent behind every Imam. Whether he's good, he's bad. Pray behind him. For if the prayer, if, 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 if he's bad, then the prayer is for you and against him. But if he's good, then the prayer is for you and for him. And our position with the, with the rulers is that the Prophet said, if they beat your backs and take your property, you don't rebel. You be patient because the time will come when Allah will remove them and give you opportunity. But if we kill every ruler that we don't like, what will, will be our case? We will just keep killing. <coughs> there will be a, a complete cycle of killing. And there's a group of Muslims who did that. When they saw a leader that they disagreed with, they kill him. And so when they got to a position, somebody killed them. And so we just keep the cycle of killing, throwing, rebelling. So then where will the loyalty come? Where will the discipline come? Where will the respect come? And let me remind the Muslims about this uh, issue, one more thing, because I think it's very important that we know the young people, they don't get so uh, angry, you see, at non-Muslims or at uh, Muslim rulers who they don't uh, like. In 1924, when the Khilafah was destroyed, let me remind the Muslims that it was not just the non-Muslims who destroyed the Khilafah, it was Muslims. And let me also remind you, that the Khilafah by itself is not a panacea. Just because we say, Sheikh, become the Khilafah, you be the Khalifa for us, does not guarantee what he will do. Because in 1924 we had Khilafah. What kind of man he was? What kind of Khilafah he was? No guarantee. We want Khilafah. We should think about it. We should plan for it. We should work for it. We have a right to pray and work and think about it. But this is not the end of Islam. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to build this Islam upon our taqwa, upon our iman, upon our responsibility. And if we don't love each other, and we don't have loyalty for each other, and we're not in obedience to the leaders of the Muslims today, how we think we're going to be in uh, obedience to the Khilafah? No, young Muslims, be very careful, inshallah that you are not drawn into a situation because of your anger and your impatience. Because maybe you will set a fire. You will set a fire that itself will cause some destruction for the Muslims. No, you be patient, inshallah. If Allah wants to replace the leaders who are tyrants, He will replace them. And if, inshallah, if you are...